Hi guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special episode of This Is Not A Top 10 for you guys. And um, this one I'm actually a little bit nervous about, mostly because, like leather, um, this is such an important note to me that we're going to cover today. It's the note of honey. I absolutely adore and love the note of honey. Um, and I'm a little worried that I'm not going to have the vocabulary to describe some of these scents to you guys. That's one of the reasons I haven't really done reviews yet is, um, number one, I don't feel like I really have any authority to review a fragrance, so I might do some kind of fraghead musing at some point of my scent of the day and talk to you guys about my thoughts and all that good stuff. Um... But number two, um, I'm, I'm a little worried that I'm not going to, to do these fragrances justice. And um, these are some, I'm looking around, these are some of my favorite fragrances in my collection. A lot of them, I could probably say they have this dirty, animalic, 70s, 80s, masculine, uh, animalic honey beeswax thing going on. And you could kind of say that for a bunch of them. So, you know, I'm going to try my best to describe these to you. Hopefully you'll learn about some new fragrances that use the note of honey uh, or beeswax. Sometimes uh, they are honey heavy. Sometimes honey is made up of the, you know, the composition is built where honey is just one part of the overall composition. But let me start with a special fragrance from Germany that is very hard to find nowadays. I bought this bottle from Anouj. Um, it is not the original issue from the 1970s but it is still made by the same company. This is Marbert Man. Now, I have a fragrance called Marbert Gentleman, which is a completely different fragrance that says that it is made in West Germany. So that's a much older bottle. This one is actually made in Germany, as you can see right there. And so there's a couple versions of this. There's the version where the Marbert Man is actually just uh, vertical instead of horizontal like it is here. Uh, and then there's a version that says classic underneath it. And I'll show you kind of another fragrance that has done that as well, where I have both versions, the classic and the vintage. But I don't have the older version of this, and I don't have the classic version of this. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing this is like a late 90s, maybe early 2000s bottle, if I had to guess. Also, because I did a big haul with Anuj, um, he sent me a body wash with algae extract and this is beautiful by the way this is um if you look at the note list perfume is like somewhere at the top so it's um it's very uh fragrant and it's very close to the fragrance um and then he also sent me this which is a uh natural deodorant spray uh and so i use this today with the body wash and um and of course the EDT. Let me give you guys a fresh spray. Um, oh my God, the sprayer on these things is immense. Oh, I love this fragrance so much. So this was made by a classic perfumer who will get his own perfumer's portfolio series called Raymond Shylon. And um, he made this in the mid 70s. Parfumo.net actually did not have the exact date. Um, Fragrantica says 1977 is when this was made. And this has a little bit of that Givenchy Gentleman from 1974 feel, which is my favorite patchouli honey animalic fragrance. This has a little bit of that honeyed feel with some animalic touches. It's very strong in the opening. Very masculine. But but it's built more along the lines of a fougere, if you can think about that. So, you know, it has um, these fresher touches, like for example, uh, there's this Artemisia, Basil, Bergamot, Lavender combo in the top. And then, oh God, there's this old school carnation. Um, Jesus Christ. Oh, this is so good. There's this old school carnation that mixes with what Fragrantica says is white honey. Now, I can't profess to know the difference between white honey and regular honey, so I couldn't speak to you there. Maybe we have a honey expert that's subscribed to the channel that can talk to us about that. But then it mixes with this juniper, with rose, 
You need geranium for a fougere. There's geranium in here. There's cinnamon. There's patchouli, oak moss, Virginia cedar, leather, sandalwood, musk, and amber. And I sprayed this five hours ago on my left hand. And it's still, I mean, I still would get whiffs of it when I would move. But the fresh spray, the first hour of this is just, you know, my head falls off. It's so good. It's so, so good. If you're a honey lover, I know this is hard to find, um, but do not be scared of this version. Now, the version that says classic on it, I've never smelled, so I can't speak to that. Maybe that, you know, some people say that is a rubbish reformulation. Um, uh, that I can't speak to, but if you can get this bottle, I think Anuj might still have some. If you're a honey lover, if you're an old school vintage lover like myself, this is... This is pure masculine. I absolutely love it. That's the thing about these uh, honey fragrances is that they're so masculine to me. Uh, the animalic honey, I guess because the next fragrance coming up was my father's signature scent for so long. It just reminds me um, so much of, you know, what men smelled like as I was growing up and as I was younger. So, you know, I'm sure there's some honey fragrances that are for women. There's actually some in the list. I'm looking at one right now. But um, these type of fragrances are so, so masculine. And they're just made to, you know, cut through the smoke. Like in the 70s and 80s when people smoked, when you went to IHOP and stuff like that, you know, this would just cut right through it. It's so, so good for, for a vintage lover. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, but this deserves some love. I mean, it. Um, no one talks about it. Let me get my handy-dandy microfiber cloth. You know, no one talks about this. Um, it just, it, it deserves more love in the community. All right, now, if you guys have watched my videos, you know that um, I am probably the anti-YouTube um, algorithm uh, YouTuber, if you could say. Uh, someone who uploads videos because uh, I actually saw a video the other day where it was like 20 seconds 10 perfumes in 20 seconds go and they were like bam bam and that's not me at all so if you're watching my videos you're probably more on the intellectual side uh, of perfumery you're not just um, a TikToker. so this is going to be a long video especially when we're talking about one of my favorite notes so you know uh, get a comfy chair and hopefully you'll enjoy this or watch part now part later okay next I'm going to go to a decant I have three bottles of this on the way and they're all Cosmere versions I am over the moon, as as Rich Mitch would say, um, that I found three Cosmere bottles at $150. It was an estate sale, and I got a great deal. I hope they were well taken care of. They're all splashed, too. Um, this is Ralph Lauren's Chaps. Now, Chaps is not a honey fragrance. It's a chiffre. Um, and it's mostly focusing on, you know, the chiffre construction with some, with some lavender. There's lavender in the top with clary sage and anise. And um, sandalwood, patchouli, vetiver, car old school carnation, excuse me, which I love. Oh, God. Um, there's orris root in this. But it's the base where the honey kind of comes in. You get this moss with amber and vanilla and benzoin and honey in the base. This was a $5 fragrance in 1979 when it came out. This just came up in my um, This Year in Perfume video who I talked about the year of 1979. And wearing this and, and smelling it made me want to go buy a couple bottles. They're going for two, $300 on eBay, which is amazing. This was a $5 fragrance. It just goes to show, you know, the value of what old perfumery was back then. Okay, so I can't wait to get those bottles in. I'll do an unboxing for you guys when they come. Next is another fragrance that I don't have a full bottle of. Um... It is a privé from the house of Christian Dior. This is Mitza. So this is a little 30 ml bottle that I got. Um, I believe I got this from someone in Israel, if I'm not mistaken. This came out a decade ago. The nose is Francois de Machy. And um, this is basically a spicy amber fragrance. So if you like fragrances like Ombre Sultan, which I do, I love that fragrance. That's my favorite in the category. If you like fragrances like Lea du Desert Marocain, um, Mitza might be right up your alley 
there is this um, coriander, cardamom thing going on in the top that mixes with the cinnamon and rose, and then the base is where the honey comes in again. Incense, white honey, just like in Marbert Man. Oh, it's so good. Um, French labdanum, patchouli, amber, vanilla. This is a warm fragrance. It's focusing on the amber note that's created by that labdanum. Uh, and it's supported by the honey, but it's got this spicy top that the first 15 minutes remind me like a mixture of um, Lair du Desert Moroccan and Fate Man from Amwash. Fate Man has that heavy cumin. Um, and this, for some reason, I kept being reminded of Fate Man. I don't know why, because um, there's no cumin here. But I think it has something to do with the spicy coriander and cinnamon thing mixing with the cardamom and giving it that strange, you know, uh, cumin feel. So just be aware of that. But once you get past 15 minutes, then it really starts to dry into that amber and labdanum vanilla honey incense, which people love. This is a great fragrance for winter. Glad to try it. Would I buy a full bottle? No. But i um, very glad to have this little decant. Like I've said before, when you have a big collection, you don't always need a full bottle of something. Sometimes a, de a decant like this is perfectly fine, and you wear it whenever you want, and, you know, who knows? You may never go through 30 ml like this. Um, okay, last decant, and then we'll get on to the full bottles. One that, if you watched my previous unboxing video from last night, you know I'm, I unboxed or did a first impression of Opus 11, uh, which is the final Opus library collection from Amwage when Christopher Chong was the creative director. Um, and if you watched my Nathalie Lorson um, Perfumers Portfolio video, you will know that this came up as a fragrance that she made in 2015 with Pierre Nagrin. This is Opus, Opus 9, I'm sorry. Opus 11 is what I did a first impression of yesterday. I wish I had a full bottle of this, and I wish I had decants of Opus 11, is the way I wish it went. Um, but the presentation, even on the decants, I mean, look at that. You've got a cap on your decant. You've got a booklet that comes with it. Um, this is, um, you know, this is a very nice decant. Look at the attention to detail that Amouage does. So, this is an animalic fragrance. Um, it it basically focuses on the note of cam or the flower camellia which if you know anything about the camellia flower, it has no smell. So just like um, they created, you know, fougere to um, act to re recreate a fern if it had a smell. That was Houbigant's initial idea with fougere royale in the 18, late 1880s. Um, this also is kind of the same idea. What would the camellia flower smell like? So um, Piana Green and uh, Nathalie Lorson got to work and created this. And there's Nathalie Lorson's patented black pepper with this jasmine, uh, with this animalic beeswax, with two other animalic notes in Opus 9. Uh, and the other two animalic notes are ambergris and civet. And, it's, and, it, and it is animalic. It's almost like this. The easiest way to describe it is an animalic floral with this beeswax, honey, guyac wood support, if you will. The honey kind of supports everything. Um, and it's, it's there. I mean, you can definitely tell that the honey is there, but this is full bottle worthy. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I, um, I really wish that oh, it's so strong too. Oh, I wish I had a full bottle of this instead of Opus 11, but, um, that's what happens when you blind buy. I take full responsibility for, for a blind buy gone wrong. I never blame anyone. Um, but I do have three decants of this, so I can still give this a lot of wares and, uh, we'll see where it takes us and maybe one day I'll find a full bottle. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the full bottles. Um, we're going to go to my father's signature scent, which is Paco Raban Porom. Now this is a vintage. Um, how does my rag keep getting over there? So this is a vintage. Um, and you can tell by the fact that the R is raised. I can actually smell it from here. 
I got some on the uh, outside of the bottle the other day when I flipped it upside down in one of my videos um, when I was highlighting the 1970s, I believe, um, 1973. And um, this is basically a fragrance where the honey only shows up in the older bat in the older bottles. So if you get a newer reformulated bottle of this they've taken away that animalic honey note which kind of ruins the fragrance because that's what this was about this was a aromatic fougere one of the best aromatic fougeres ever created and it was supposed to have this animalic honey that came in after a couple hours once it dried you really got that honey accord um that mixed with the real oak moss in this oh it's so I have so many memories of this, um, you know, going places with my father, going to the zoo or, you know, whatever we did as a family. This was his signature scent for my entire life, basically. This came out in 73. I was born in 85, and uh, he still wears this to this day. He just wears the newer formula. I should probably get him a bottle like this. I mean, Rudy was telling me he bought one on eBay for, this is a uh, 60 milliliter splash for like 60 bucks um definitely worth it this is so much better with the raised r than the newer formulations they've kind of butchered this a little bit it's still a great fragrance especially with the crap they're putting out now but uh, the rosemary and brazilian uh rosewood in the top this you know aromatic top mixes with the lavender geranium there's coumarin there's tonka of course it's a fougere um, and then that honey that comes in after the first couple hours is just to die for. There's another floral honey fragrance that Paco Rabanne put out that I absolutely adore. I love this fragrance. No one talks about it again. So you can see the kind of fragrances that I'm talking about I love are not mainstream fragrances. I'm not going to hype Eros or, um, you know, something like that. Um... Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that really interests me, and it just, you know, these 80s fragrances were so complex, the material was, um, the material used was top-notch. I mean, you know, the, the quality of the materials back then was unmatched today, um, and the, they used much more naturals. They also took their time. It was very common for a perfumer to take years to put a fragrance out. Now, they pump out fragrances every month, you know. Uh, go look at Alberto Mordias's, um portfolio. Go see how many perfumes he put out versus someone like Edmund Rudnitska. He's probably done a thousand perfumes, maybe more. And Edmund Rudnitska, who is considered to be one of the greatest perfumers of all time, has like 16 to his name. So look at the difference, you know. It, it was It's just a different world from the 80s. This is a fragrance called uh, Paco Rabanne Tenere. Now, Tenere um, is a fragrance that I don't think many people nowadays would like because it is a huge animalic floral, and it has multiple animalic pieces to it. It has cassia, which is like the um, leaves of the blackcurrant plant, and those go animalic. Um, it also has animalic honey, and it has this big floral accord for for a masculine um but it keeps the um it keeps a little bit of that fougere structure in some way if you will this is almost like a modern what would you call this you like a like an amber aromatic fougere maybe i can't think of a better way to put it but there still is lavender there's still rosemary, just like Paco Rabanne for Rome. Uh, but what they've done is they've taken the floral heart and they've amped it up to the millionth degree. The rose, carnation, jasmine, lily of the valley are huge in this fragrance. And orris. There's this um, powdery orris that, that seeps through as well. Um, but there's still masculine notes. There's anise, there's tarragon, there's leather. Uh, there's patchouli, there's cedar, it's woody, there's amber, there's vetiver in the base. Look how complex this fragrance is. So as soon as I got through some of this, this is a small bottle. Uh, this is a 25 milliliter splash, okay? As soon as I realized what this was after having it for, you know, a year and giving it a full couple wears, I went out and bought the biggest bottle I could find. This is a 200 ml 
splash. Uh, this is a 25 ml splash. So look at that. Um, that's what I did. That's how much I love this fragrance. If you see me with a backup bottle, you know I love a fragrance. Um, and there's some real backup bottle worthy fragrances. This fragrance I'm wearing today is backup bottle worthy. If I could ever find an original formulation, Marbert Man, where the Marbert Man is written vertical instead of horizontal, I would definitely go for it. it they're just impossible to find. Um, but Paco Rabanne Tenere, if you like floral masculine fragrances, if you like the fragrance I'm going to show you next, there's another one in this genre that's coming up. Excuse me. Um, go try this. You can still get this for a good price. I think I got this for $30 is 25 ml and I think I got this 200 ml for 130 or 140 or something. Uh, unbelievable for a old school masculine with this quality where you get three ingredients listed. You don't have the long list of ingredients. So th these are vintage bottles. The Tenere is actually rubbing off as you can see. Uh, whereas here it's still, it's still well taken care of. But either way, the juice has been well taken care of. I, I've tested them both. Um, and this is going to be a staple in my collection for many, many years to come. Okay, so on to the sister fragrance of this, I will call it. By the way, Tenere came out in the late 80s, 88. This fragrance came out um, one year earlier, 1987. Can you guess what it is? This is Alain Delon's Aquitos. Now, this is also a big floral masculine fragrance. And in fact, this fragrance was pitched to Dior. And they said no, that a man should not smell like this. Um, and I think they went with Fahrenheit, which, good for them. But I'm sure they wish they would have also taken this fragrance because this is an amazing fragrance. This is a floral oak moss bomb. Um, this fragrance can sometimes... It could smell like a traditional quote-unquote old lady at certain points. Gerard Anthony made this. It's a very complex fragrance. Uh, there's oak moss out the wazoo of this fragrance. If you're an oak moss lover, I mean, look at the color of the bottle. It looks like oak moss. Um, and this is supposed to look like, the bottle is supposed to look like the head of a snake. Uh, and the advertisement had like a snake dangling down you know, looking at you from, from on top while the bottle was below. And it was supposed to be like you're, you're traveling down the Amazon, uh, you know, the jungle, and all the different things that you get. This is a extremely complex fragrance. Um, if you have a virgin nose, if you're new to the perfume game, you will not like this. I can almost guarantee you, you will not like this. You will say it smells like an old lady. You will say it smells like grandma. You will say that it stinks. You will say that it's not, you know, it's not something that's good. But trust me, um, this is a fragrance that I would urge you, if you are newer to the fragrance game, if you don't like it, don't sell it. Put it away. Go put it away for a year or two and come back to it after your nose has matured a little bit. Because this fragrance is the... There's a reason that it's selling for three, four hundred dollars on eBay, and it's not just supply and demand. Um, there are notes in this that even if Roja Dove wanted to recreate this, they couldn't because of the limits from Ifra. They can't use the amount of oak moss that's in this. They can't use the amount of civet. They can't use the natural rose absolute in the quantity needed to create this fragrance. It's so good. And again, I've got a splash and I've got a spray. This is a nuge. I got this from eBay years ago. Um, this is a 50 ml, this is 100 ml. Um, so, backup bottle worthy. Both of the masculine florals I have backups of. So glad that I do. That is a ketose. And the honey in this is part of the overall composition. The honey in Paco Rabanne Tenere, I would say, is a little bit more front and center, whereas the honey in this is more part of the overall floral composition. But Fantastic fragrance. Both are very complex. If you like fragrances that tell a story, that take you somewhere, these two are should be top of your list. But they are hard to get. Don't go pay a fortune for them if you can't afford it. Um, they're not that, you know, you shouldn't go mortgage the house to get them, which is what some of the perfume prices are seeming like they're going. But, um, you know, those are one to put on the radar. If you get a good deal, snag it. Okay, now we're going to move back 
we're going to go move forward in time, I should say, a couple years to the year 1991. This is a Alberto Morias creation. This is the kind of stuff that he put out back then. It's pretty impressive. This is a fragrance called Romeo Gigli Per Uomo. Romeo Gigli Per Uomo. Look at this cap. Um, it, it, it works like this where here's the clasp, it opens up and then it's a splash. So you can just take the top off like so. Um, this is an Anuj find for me. Um, so thank you, Anuj. Uh, the juice is insane. The juice and the smell don't match. Okay. This is not a green, uh, fragrance like you're thinking. This is a woody, spicy, ambery fragrance, which you wouldn't guess by the juice. Um, but obviously, they did their market research, and maybe in the early 90s, this would sell. Also, this is a vintage when Romeo Gigli was the distributor before somebody bought them. This is made in Italy. Let me see if I can show you this without getting it all over the place, since it's a splash. Romeo Gigli is the distributor. Also, only three ingredients, I believe, on this box three or four. Um, and I don't have too much experience with this. I'm still kind of waiting to get to know it a little bit, but it's an, it, it's also a very complex fragrance. There's rosewood, lavender, there's a plum note in here, which sometimes plum can be executed well or not executed well. I've never given this a full wear, but just testing this, um, you know, before bed at night, I can tell you the plum in here is done very well. There's also this masculine aldehydic bright um, you know, sunny feeling when you first spray that mixes with the fresh citruses, bergamot, mandarin, orange, and grapefruit. And then there's a lemon tree accord, which is very interesting. I've never seen it on Fragrantica before, but apparently the lemon tree accord is a very complex aroma that's supposed to let you feel like you're standing around a lemon tree, which also has, you know, the crushed leaves. It has the tart you know, ambiance, it has the, you know, it's supposed to smell like you're standing around a living tree in the opening, and, and you do get a little bit of that, but then it goes into that heavier heart, which is cinnamon, balsam firs, honey, old school carnation, which I love, ginger, rose, jasmine, patchouli, sandalwood, oak moss, benzoin, amber, cedar, musk, vanilla, tonka bean, styrax. So you can see, this is the kind of stuff Alberto Mortiès was creating before he created Aqua de Joe. Um, to somebody like me, this is much more interesting than Aqua de Joe. Now, I've never smelled the reformulated version. They might have completely butchered this, okay? Um, but if you can get this at a good price and you can get the vintage, uh, go for it. Go for it. I would say this is one to put on the radar. Okay. Next are two fragrances that absolutely blew me away and are absolutely backup bottle worthy. I don't have backup bottles though, but let's start with the more famous of the two and then I'll show you a little bit of the hidden gem. Um, so this is a this is an Italian fragrance company called Rocco Barocco. Rocco Barocco. And this is joint. Now, the writing on my bottle has worn off. You can maybe see where it said joint right here. Um, and it said Rocco Barocco right here. Um, and basically, now apparently there's different distributors. Mine is distributed by, come on baby, there you go. Par God damn it, come on. Parfums uh, 2P. So there was also a different distributor um, that... I hear both are very good though, and I can vouch for this version. I, I didn't know there were multiple distributors when I bought this, but this is long discontinued. Um, and this fragrance blew me away. I love wearing this fragrance. It, it was launched in 1993, so right before the fresh wave washed everything away. And it's kind of like this masculine woody chiffre is what it is, but they took some feel from Koro's and they took this honeyed civet feel and mixed it in with this chiffre, which I love. So there's that bright aldehydes at the top, but they literally last seconds. I mean, they're swallowed up by the heavier notes in this. This is a heavy fragrance. So when you first spray, you get hit with this bright aldehydic, spicy with coriander, caraway, lemon, 
and then boom, it's swallowed up by the heavier fragrance. Tobacco, honey, carnation, rose, jasmine, cardamom, geranium, orris root, and then in the base, civet, patchouli, leather, labdanum, vetiver, amber, musk, cedar, tonka bean, I just feel so at home wearing these type of fragrances. If you like fragrances like Koros, Furyo, check this out. Um, this is amazing. Um, this absolutely blew me away. I have given this full wears. It's definitely backup bottle worthy, but I have 100 ml. And as you can see, I've taken pretty good care of it. Um, the juice level is... Uh, maybe 95 ml, which it, for my collection is probably enough, but still you worry, am I going to get to experience this fragrance ever again? If I blow through this and try to buy a bottle in five years, what will the prices be? They're a hundred dollars right now for a hundred ml. What will they be in five years? Perfume prices are going insane. So this is one where the honey really mixes with that civet like in Coro so well. Uh, this is a this was a shock to me how good this was. In fact, Sebastian from, I think he's called Mr. Perfume Guy now or something. Uh, he used to be called Looking Good, Smelling Great Fragrance Reviews or something. But um, Sebastian Yara said that he put this as his number one vintage masculine fragrance of, of uh, on on his countdown list that he did, which completely shocked me. I was not expecting this to be number one. This is kind of an under the radar type thing, but it's getting more attention. So if you see a bottle at a good price and you're looking for it, grab it. Um, and then there's another fragrance from the same house. I don't know anything about this fragrance and for some reason I can't find any info on it. There is a listing in Fragrantica, but there's no info. There's no release date. There's no notes. There's no perfumer. Uh, it's not listed in Parfumo.net, and it's not listed in Base Notes. So, I don't know, but uh, I bought this blind off of a news because of how much I liked Joint. Uh, it's the exact same company, but this is called Rocco Barocco EDT Porome. Okay, can you see that? Rocco Barocco EDT Porome. Okay, so... This is almost like a brother to, to joint, um, but the leather is a little bit more amped up in this. Is the only thing I can think of wearing it. There's this amped up leather accord. Some people compare it to Arrogance um, Pour Homme, which I've never smelled. That's an early 80s fragrance. There's some people that compare it to Trasardi Womo, but I don't think the two smell the same, other than the fact that this has leather amped up a little bit more than joint does um i don't think that this smells like trusardi womo um and then there's some people that compare it to boss number one which is coming up later i don't really see that comparison as much other than the fact that there is this honey now i'm guessing there's honey in this i i can't see a note breakdown this is right off of my nose um but the honey really hits you in this in fact i think the honey is even heavier in this than it is in joint because joints about the chifra uh, civet um you know there is honey playing into the accord but this i feel like the honey is even more amped up like in boss number one so it's like this crazy mixture of boss number one and maybe like a little bit of a leather fragrance but not trusardi womo <sighs> maybe because they're both italian brands rocco barocco i'm guessing rocco barocco is an italian that's the most Italian sounding name I've ever heard. And um, Trusardi is Italian. Maybe that's why they're compared. I don't know. But if you know anything about this, let me know. This is a 30 ml bottle that I bought from uh, Anuj Blind because I like the brand. And boy, did this work out. I need a bigger bottle, to be honest with you. They make 100 ml bottles too. But um, this is a revelation. Huge hidden gem. I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about this, ever. <sighs> Amazing. Uh, okay, this video is going to be like 17 hours at this rate, by the way. Okay, now let's go on to what I would call a fresh honey fragrance. Um, I am torn on this fragrance because it's a designer, and it's a Cartier, and it's done by uh, Mathieu Laurent, and 
she took a chance here, and I have to give her credit for that. However, I don't like this fragrance for some reason. It bothers me, um, and I'm not sure what it is. Yura and I were talking about this. This came out in 2016. Um, this is a fragrance called L'Anval, and there's a beautiful uh, bottle that is, uh, it looks like a, a beautiful crystal glass, champagne glass thinness. Um, this, this is the thicker version. I like this because it won't break. I think this because this is a tester, they decided to make this, but I like this better because I've heard a lot of horror stories about the other one breaking. You could take the inside of the other one out and you would just be left with this beautiful piece of glass work. Um, the top comes up and down like this. So if you wanted to store it in a bag or something, you know, you could, and it won't spray. Um, so the design is cool, but what this is, is this is basically a honey violet leaf combo with this freshness at the top that I think that's what bothers me. I really don't know. It has this lavender artemisia and sage top with violet leaf and pepper and honey and iris and, and guyac wood, musk, patchouli, amber woods, vetiver and cedar. Maybe it's the synthetic amber woods. Maybe it's the fact that I like my honey dirty. You can tell the kind of honey fragrances I like already. We haven't even got to the second part of the collection yet. Um, I like fragrances like this, heavy, masculine, animalic honey. And this is just this fresh, like if you wanted to wear a fragrance in the summer, there's this and there's another one coming up after this that are great summer honey fragrances because of the freshness. I just don't enjoy it as much. That's all I can say about it. There's, I, I give her high marks for trying something different. The fact that a designer put this out is, um, is very brave. It says, an airy and woody nectar, a life potion for men to take off. Uh, musk, guyac wood, and honey notes. So, anyways, try this. Don't let my discouraging discussion put you off. Uh, but if you don't like the dirty animalic honeys that I'm talking about, this is one to, to give a try to. If you're looking for a fresher honey to wear during the summer, check check out Lombal EDP. This is the EDP. They also made an EDT, which I've never smelled. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the other fragrance. If I had to pick a fragrance with the note of honey to wear more in the summer, this would be one of them. This is Lagerfeld's Photo. Now, this is the reformulated version because this is distributed by Unilever, but I got such a great deal on this that I just couldn't say no. As much as I wanted a vintage, um, this fragrance is not worth $250 or $300 to get a vintage. I got this at 40 bucks or something. 60 ml which is a strange size but uh whatever you know I, as you can see i've given it a, a few wears the juice is right there um and this is a this this fragrance i i heard thomas from early greek say this fragrance would be a niche fragrance today and i completely agree because there's this amazing aldehydes in the top. Maybe some of the best aldehydes I've ever smelled uh, in the top of this fragrance with this fresh lavender and then citruses, lemon bergamot, mandarin with galbanum, okay? But the galbanum is not like the galbanum in number 19. It's not this green, heavy, fresh. It's very airy and light. Then you get into the heart. That's where the meat and potatoes of this fragrance really live. You get Carnation, old school Carnation, which I love. This was 1990, I believe. Um, and that's right around the end of the time the Carnation phase really started to, to die down. Um, for masculine fragrances anyways. That Carnation was a masculine fragrance note for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden it just died. Uh, rose, Jasmine, Coriander, Honey, Caraway, Cyclamen. And then the base is oak moss, benzoin, musk, sandalwood, patchouli, cedar, amber, tonka, guyac wood. Now, hearing those notes, you would think this is a heavy fragrance. It's not. This works amazing in spring and summer. Because there's this dichotomy between the fresh lavender, aldehyde, citrus in the top with this um, 
heavier base bubbling underneath, but it never takes over, if that makes sense. So underneath, you get this honey, you get this um, little bit of a floral heart, you get the heavier oak moss and benzoin and musk, but it's all kind of in the background you know it's like it's like you're looking at a shadow of those heavier notes the main uh accord that carries the fragrance is that fresh lavender aldehydes and some citruses um this is a very interesting composition for warmer weather to me i wouldn't wear this in the winter i would wear this in the warmer weather um if you love the House of Lagerfeld, get your get your nose on this. I wouldn't pay big. There there are differences between the vintage and this. I have a a, a mini vintage uh, where this looks more like the um, you know old school cameras where the lens would pop out and it had those ribs around it. Um, you know, if you find one that the writing was also different, it didn't look like this. It it said photo in a in a different way, like with some, um, I think it was like with some lime green, orange, you know, lime green um, highlighted uh, letters. And, and the Lagerfeld was written in the old Lagerfeld way, like on my Lagerfeld classic bottle I showed you from a previous video. So that's photo. And then we're going to go on to Cher Guy. Now, Cher Guy needs no introduction. This was a beast hype monster. Uh, from the old days of Fragcom, and I love this fragrance. This is Christopher Sheldrake at his best, right up there with Ombre Sultan to me. Uh, this is tobacco, honey, amber, hay. The note of hay is not used very often, and you definitely get that hay note here. With sandalwood and one of the most beautiful irises you will ever smell with musk and rose. Oh, it's just heavenly. It is literally heavenly. I mean, I feel like I'm wearing something that is so special when I wear this. Um, and it is so special. This is a 50 ml vintage. I've never smelled the new stuff. I try to avoid the newer Serge Luton's bottles. I try to go for these older ones. But Cher Guy, look at the color of the juice. I mean, my God. Just gorgeous. And, and the honey in this just accents that tobacco so well. <sighs> Love it. And then, let's say it's, uh, uh, by the way, Cher Guy came out in uh, 2005. This fragrance came out in 2012. So this is like its older brother, if you will. Cher Guy is the, is, is, the, is the younger brother that paved the way. But this is um, Volutes from Diptyque. And they always do these beautiful drawings on the back. Uh, gorgeous presentation by Diptyque. I like the EDTs for Diptyque. They tend to breathe a little bit more than the EDPs. Uh, this is so good as well. These two are two peas in a pod. Even though this is this looks like a completely different fragrance juice-wise, there are differences, obviously. They're different fragrances. But um, this was done by uh, Fabrice Pelligran. And this has tobacco, honey, iris, flower, dried fruits. Hay, again, the note of hay, but they've added Immortel, Saffron, Pink Pepper, Black Pepper, Benzoin, Apopanax, which is sweet myrrh, myrrh, uh, and Styrax. So you can see they've kind of done a little, um, they've done some some extra touches to Volutes. I still prefer Shergi. That's my, that I don't know if you could replace that for this DNA, but this is so good. Um, and if you can get the EDT, I would recommend that over the EDP, but both are good. Amazing composition. Um, excuse me whilst I hydrate, as the duck would say. 45 minutes, we still got half a table to go. Okay, next, we're going to go to an all-time great, um... And I'll show you my three bottles of this. This is Lapidus Pour Homme. This is the newer version and with the built-in sprayer. And these two are vintage splashes where there's only three ingredients listed. This one has an ingredient list, you know, this long like newer bottles do. But this is still a good reformulation. Lapidus uh, Pour Homme is one of the greatest masculines of all time. 
It um, it was created by Martin Gras, which I believe ended up being like the boss of some of the bigger perfume uh, oil houses. I think uh, Pierre Bourdon worked for him, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, this has pineapple in the top. This is an insane look, note breakdown. I can't go through it all, but it's pineapple, lavender, artemisia, juniper with honey, incense, pine, rose, rose wood. Um, or, there's orris in here. Uh, there's tobacco. There's patchouli, oak moss. There's sandalwood. There's tonka. There's cedar. Basically, there's everything in this bottle, if you will. And you would think it wouldn't work, but it does. Somehow, it just works so beautifully. Um, the, the vintage is better, go figure, it's deeper, it's richer, it lasts longer. Uh, the openings are, are very different because you get this heavier synthetic opening in the newer one, but I still like it. Um, I think the House of Jacques Bogard has done an unbelievable job of keeping their fragrances up to snuff, even through all the regulations. I have no clue how they do it. Okay, let's go to the next side of the table, and we're going to start with an absolute 10 out of 10 if I gave ratings. Um, one of the greatest masculines of all time, needs no introduction. This is Balenciaga Por Homme. Um, this is more about cinnamon and spices and patchouli, like a patchouli from Mars, you know, is what this fragrance reminds me of. Uh, again, I'll reference Thomas from early Greek. He said that, uh, this is the 100 ml splash, this is a 30 ml, um, I think this is a 30 yeah, this is a 30 ml spray. <sighs> this is probably one of the best fougeres of all time, in, in my personal opinion. Um, again, the note breakdown's insane. One of the best um, uses of patchouli with the spicy cinnamon sandalwood thing going on. But the honey, the honey in this... <laughs> Makes it so, so good. Here, let me read you the notes. This is a tester. So I've got the notes. This is from Mood to Seer. Thank you, sir. Um, so the top, we've got Cylon Cinnamon. I don't know what that means. Italian Bergamot, Coriander, and Thyme. The body has Patchouli, Sandalwood, Cypress, and Cedar. The dry notes, dry notes, Oak Moss, Yugoslavian Oak Moss. Excuse me. Uh, let's be correct here. Vanilla bourbon, amber, and musk. Oh, Jesus Christ. If you've never smelled Balenciaga Por Homme and you like old school fragrances, this is a Gerard Anthony masterpiece in perfumery. There, there's also a rumor that this was the first Oud Accord in the base of this. I don't know. I can't agree or disagree with that, but um, that's what some people say. Okay, now we're going to move on to the lone feminine fragrance in this lineup. Um, they're all masculine. Uh, they're all masculine or unisex, except for this. This was a feminine targeted fragrance from 1985. Uh, well, the original was 85, I think. This one came out in the 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. Early 90s. It's by Edward Fleischer. This is Poison Esprit. De parfum. So Dior used a spree de parfum instead of extray. So this is the extray, if you want to be so exact. And you can tell it's a vintage by the fact that it actually says uh, Christian Dior right there. Parfums Christian Dior. Uh, they stopped using the Christian Dior. Well, I guess you could have seen it at the front much easier. Duh. Um, they stopped using Christian Dior a long time ago in the early 2000s and just went to Dior. So if you ever see something that says Christian Dior, you're looking at an older bottle. Uh, but this is, um, again, honey is used as part of the larger composition. This is mostly about this crushed fruit accord, almost like this fruit melange, if you will, um, with tuberose. One of the most beautiful tuberoses I've ever smelled is in this fragrance. Um incense and cloves you know it's it's it takes that incense clove thing that opium does and gives it its own um personality if you will with honey cinnamon a poppinax that sweet myrrh there's rose jasmine and orange blossom to complement the tuberose 
and then the base is Amber Musk Vanilla Heliotrope, which is usually a very overbearing floral, but it's used well here. Sandalwood, Vetiver, and Cedar. I will wear this. Uh, this is not just a reference for me. I, I prefer to wear some of the more masculine fragrances, like my scent of the day, but I will wear this from time to time because I just enjoy that uh, shock factor that people get when they smell that on you. <sighs> Marbert Man is so good. Okay, now we're going to move on to some gourmands. Uh, before we give a tribute to Thierry Mugler, who passed away last week, rest in peace, Manfred Thierry Mugler, I want to talk about a fragrance that came out a year or two before Amen. Uh, this came out in 1994. Amen came out in 1996. No one talks about this, but they should. Um, this is from the house of Animal. It's Animal Animal for men, which is confusing because there is an Animal for men, which is a completely different fragrance. Animal Animal for men came out in 1994. I could not find a perfumer, unfortunately, but uh, this takes this pineapple opening thing that this does with honey and turns it into a precursor to the gourmand that Amen became. Okay, so think about Amen. Take the tar note out. Um, maybe make it a little bit more, make it a little bit more like Angel, the original Angel, which I think came out in 1992 or 1993. That was an Olivier Cresp, and everyone started copying Angel. Well, Animal Animal obviously took that DNA and ran with it and created basically Amen before Amen came out. So this deserves more talk. Um, and e this is a cheapie. This will be on my cheapie list. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Uh, because it has this honeyed tobacco. <sighs> it's so good. Um, you know, it has this honey tobacco with pineapple, patchouli. The patchouli in this is unreal. Um, nutmeg, lavender, sandalwood, musk, lime, galbanum, lang lang, cedar, rose, jasmine, lemon, lily of the valley. It's a precursor to Amen. There's absolutely no question about it. It doesn't have some of the crazy gourmand notes listed on Fragrantica, but if you smell them side by side, you will notice that, number one, the quality of this will shock you, and not because it's bad, because it's good. Um, you would think this is going to be shite compared to Amen. It's not. Obviously, Amen's quality is a, is just maybe a little bit better. But uh, if you're on a budget, boy, for 20 bucks, 100 ml, and they still make their own fragrances. No one bought them, ever. So this Animal House is still pumping these out to this day. Um, there you go. So, interesting house, if I do say so myself. But now let's get to Amen. Um, and amazing use of honey patchouli in this. This is a, this is a, this is what's credited as the first gourmand. But as you can see, Animal, Animal kind of took that crown a couple years before. Um, this adds some insane notes like mint, fruity notes. There was, there was pineapple in, in Animal, Animal. So this just says fruity notes. Um, caramel, patchouli, honey, milk, coffee. There's a coffee accord here. Um, I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison with Animal, Animal, if you guys want one day. But this is one where honey is part of the overall composition. This is a bottle back when it said Angel Men, as you can see right there on the top right. Before it said Amen, so this is even an older bottle. But anything you can get that says Thierry Mugler on it, like it does down on the bottom right-hand side of the screen right there. Thierry Mugler on his signature right there is good. Do not buy the Mugler. L'Oreal butchered the current bottles of Mugler, in my opinion. Don't, don't sue me, L'Oreal. I'm just telling you what I think. Um, if you can find these older bottles of Amen, scoop them up. <sighs> so good. And then, if you like honey, this is really their honey fragrance. This is pure Havan. This is heavy white honey with tobacco. Um, that's basically what it is. It's heavy white honey with uh, tobacco on top of that Amen base. Cacao, vanilla, patchouli, French labdanum. It, there is this cherry tobacco, you know, like this, like, you know, how smokers used to keep that tobacco in a pouch. Imagine if it was a cherry pouch. Uh, and that's what you get in the opening of this. 
fantastic fragrance. One of my favorite sweet, you know, I usually don't like sweet fragrances, but I like this for some reason. I don't know why. Sometimes it just melds with your nose and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, now we're going to move on to a fragrance you've never seen before, but is the closest thing to Marbert Man to me. Okay, Marbert Man's my scent of the day. This is what we started with 54 minutes ago, 55 minutes ago. Now we're going to move on to its cousin. And this is a fragrance that... If you're a vintage hunter, you have to find this fragrance and buy it and own it. So this is a fragrance that's called Alain Delon. Now, this says classic right here. This one doesn't. This is the original formulation that Anuj found me a tester of, which, God bless you, Anuj. Um, I can tell you that I will do a comparison one day. Oh, God. But this... Um, these two share some similarities. They both have these fresh, bright notes with this heavy honey and oak moss underneath. Um, Marbert Man, I think, is a little bit more to the Givenchy gentleman side of the of the honey, if you will. Whereas um, Alain Delon tends to focus more on the lavender pine and geranium with honey and oak moss kind of supporting everything but here in the vintage the honey is amped up look at the difference in the juice color the honey and the oak moss and everything is amped up here i'll do a comparison between these two my god this is these are just the kind of fragrances i love wearing and this is another one like photo because of the fact that um you know the aldehydes, some of the best aldehydes I've ever smelled in these two fragrances right here. Outside of Bernard Chant's Aramis fragrances, these two are just ungodly good for aldehyde lovers. Um, uh, I just, I just feel, I don't, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but I feel so at home with these fragrances, these honeyed, um, you know, masculine. This is pure masculine. I don't know who the perfumer is. Uh, it came out in 1980, which is a fantastic year. That's the next year in, in the This Year in Perfumery series that we will be doing. So this will get highlighted again. And uh, I mean, what can I say? It's, it's one of the best amber fougeres I've ever smelled. I mean, literally. It deserves all of the love. Even the classic is good. People shit all over this and say, oh, the classic is not what the original is. Obviously, there's differences, but this is still an amazing fragrance. This was created by or distributed by um, Wurtz and, and uh, Wurtzka and Joel and Joel. Um, and I've noticed that they have done good, good work as far as distributions go. This is just the original. It just says Alain Delon on the bottom of the bottle right there. Um, but so, so good. And I love wearing these type of fragrances. Again, these are two peas in a pod. If you like one, hunt the other one down. If you've never smelled them, these are a vintage hunter's dream, especially for um, honey. Oh, so good. Okay, and then speaking of honey and fruity and olibanum, this is Bertrand Duchafort at his absolute best, 2008. This is... Um, Jubilation 25 from Amouage. Look at the dent I put in that bottle. I bought this new, by the way. Um, that's quite the dent for my collection. I love this fragrance. My wife loves this fragrance on me. <sighs> Best blackberry note ever in perfumery. Um, mixed with this olibanum, honey. This is such a complex fragrance. There's oud, apopanax, myrrh, patchouli, cedar, ambergris, immortelle, musk, oak moss, um... Cinnamon, bay leaves, cloves, rose, orchid, celery seeds, coriander, tarragon. Oh, it's so, so good. It deserves all of the praise that it gets. Um, and mine is a made in Oman bottle, as you can see right there. And um, I mean, as a first fragrance for Christopher Chong to launch his career as creative director... Well, how could you improve on this? I mean, this is a must-own for fragrance lovers. Um, 
If you've never tried it, you, you're living under a rock or, or you're not big into the fragrance game. This used to be hyped to holy heaven. Not many people talk about it anymore, but I will tell you, if you love honey, um, if you love Arabic perfumery, um, you know, with heavy resins and olibanum, this is as good as it gets. And then we're going to go to a cheapie. This will be on my cheapie list. Uh, this is a fragrance that, again, doesn't get much talk, but it's very complex. This is the um, the Circle Bottle, Bijon Man. Um, this is now distributed by a company called Five Star Fragrances Company, which I have no clue who they are. They must be a small company like Animal Animal. Um, but this fragrance was apparently Arnold Schwarzenegger's signature scent, the donut. Um, but it's still very well maintained. This is a modern bottle. This is not a vintage. Um, 75 ml, no cap because I got a tester, but I just bought it as cheap as I could and that was like $18 or something. Oak moss, sage, nutmeg, lavender, um, lemon, bergamot, fruity notes, carnation, honey, fir, cinnamon, tarragon. I, there's iris in this, which I love. There's leather, cloves, patchouli, musk, rosemary, vetiver, benzoin, cedar, vanilla, tonka, and I left out about seven notes. So you can see the level of perfumery back then was just on a different level. The only people releasing notes like this nowadays are like Roja, and he's charging $500 a bottle. That's what we have to get nowadays to get this type of perfumery. It's sad. This is what they were putting out for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars $10 a bottle back then. 1987. Amazing. All right, let's go back in time. Let's go to the 1960s. This is 1966, and this is Canon Cologne. Now, this came out right around the time Abbey Rouge by Guerlain came out. They both share this powderiness. Obviously, Abbey Rouge is the better fragrance, in my opinion. Uh, but this is overlooked, way overlooked. In fact, the only reason I even got this is because Anuj sent it to me as part of a larger order as a thank you for making the order. Made in Canada. Which, there's different versions. I don't know what's good or what's bad. I saw some bottles going on eBay for $250. I have no clue what the different versions are. But when you've been around since 1966, this is a Scandinavian house. I guess there's a reason for it. But it's basically um, citruses in the top with clary sage. Lily of the Valley. Egyptian jasmine. Violet. Cinnamon. Olibanum. And then there's two types of moss. There's tree moss and oak moss mixed with musk and patchouli, sandalwood, amber, honey, and Haitian vetiver is in the base to support. So the honey is almost like a supporting note, um, but the powderiness here from the jasmine and lily of the valley and violet, they just don't make fragrances like this anymore. You know, this is just something to experience and where it's a different time. You know, it's like stepping into a time machine. Um, and then I'm going to show you a modern unisex fragrance. This is a rose oud combo. This is my favorite from Bond Number no. 9. I'm torn on the house. Well, I'm not torn on the house. I should say I don't like the house. I was torn on showing this to you because the woman who runs the house has done some things that I'm not a fan of in the fragrance community. You know, she had Sebastian Yara's earlier channel, Man Loves Perfume, shut down because of some of the things that he said about her. He basically said one of her fragrances was crap. And uh, so he doesn't talk about her fragrances at all. She was a lady, um, her name was, uh, I think, Patrice Loris or something like that. Loris something. Um, she was a distributor for Creed. And um, she created her own house, which is called Bond Number no. 9. This is New York Oud. So I actually really like this fragrance. I believe it's discontinued and going for silly money now. This is a 50 ml. It's a rose oud combo. But it uses a couple notes that I really like. I love the way that plum is used in this fragrance. And I love the way that the honey note is used to kind of support everything with um, musk. You know, the musk that, that they use in Bond Number no. 9 is very specific. You can almost pick it out. It's a, it's a very specific type of musk. And um, I actually really like this fragrance. This is the only fragrance from them that I have that I really like. I have two other bottles that I'm kind of lukewarm on. But I was debating on whether to show this because of some of her 
um, the way that she's treated some of the people in Fragcom. I mean, you know, she is uh, pretty litigious if you say anything bad about her stuff. So I'm saying something good, but still, I mean, who knows with, you know, you deal with somebody like that, whether they'll come after you and try to shut your channel down, even if I only have 400 subscribers. Um, so anyways, this is uh, Bond number nine's New York Oud. It is, um, it is my favorite Bond number nine fragrance by far. It's completely unisex, but it is a rose oud. This came out uh, a decade ago, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, that was all the craze back then. So now rose ouds might be a little bit out of, out of touch, out of style, but uh, very good fragrance. I only have a 50 ml. I wish I had a fit. I wish I had a hundred ml of this and a 50 ml of some of the other Bond number no. nines I bought, like the centipede for him, which is, you know, stuff like that. Okay, now my favorite animalic honey fragrance, and you know what's coming. There is no surprise here. It is um, probably the greatest animalic fragrance ever created. Um, it's a Pierre Bourdon masterpiece. It is the original Koros. Anytime I have two bottles, you know I love it. And, you know, wearing old Koros out in the world is, you know, Thomas from Early Greek said this, too. He said, wearing old Koros out in the world just makes you feel different in a way. Because, you know, you're, you're out in the world, you're wearing something that is completely out of style. No one's wearing this. Um, and so you really do stand out. And there's this beautiful... Um, civet and honey that you get. It's so, it's so animalic. It just touches a part of your brain that's like, you know, buried, you know, like, the, you know, scientists say we only use like 10% of our brain. This touches a part of the brain that's there that you don't even know, you know, that it's being used kind of thing to me. This is a, this is a primal fragrance. Primal is the best word that I can use for it. But the civet, honey, it's this sexual, you know, just, it's so good. I love wearing this stuff. I need to wear it more. I need to wear my favorites more. I keep wearing other things, testing them, and I need to just wear my favorite fragrances more, and this is on the wear more list. Okay, now we're going to go on to another Rich Mitch favorite, and this is Luciano Pavarotti for him. Uh, I had another bottle of this that broke, actually, um, but the top part actually broke off, and so I was able to salvage most of the juice into decanters, but I got a backup bottle, and I'm very glad that I did. This is a splash, um, and this is in a, coming up in a line of fragrances that are heavy, like, um, they, to me, feel like this heavy patchouli honey fragrance, but this feels fresher. Uh, because this has some um, lemon verbena, petit grain, narrowly, ivy, bergamot, and a malty lemon in the top. And then you get to the patchouli and the iris and the rose, cloves, geranium. There's a beautiful honey. The honey's there from the beginning. Oh, this and the next few fragrances all kind of remind me of each other. Uh, even though they're different, they're all... They all kind of hearken to each other. They they call to each other, if you will. And um, so that is Pavarotti. Get it while you can. By the way, um, Pavarotti sung in an opera um, called Turendo. And Turendo, there was a song that he sung that Rich Mitch sent to me called Nessun Dorma, which was just gave me chills. Listen, I've never listened to him sing that for some reason. And um, Roja Dove is creating a tur Turando um, fragrance. So if it smells like Pavarotti, these bottles are going to go to $1,000 a bottle on eBay because they're very limited now. The supply is starting to dwindle. If he, if he makes a recreation of Pavarotti, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose it. I'm going to sell all my Roja Doves. Okay, next on to a discontinued Tom Ford um private blend, which is very hard to find. I'm glad I have this little decant. It's called Moss Brex. And Moss Brex is all about... It's all about patchouli, just like Pavarotti. To me, they're patchouli-centered fragrances with honey and other notes 
you know, bringing them up. And uh, this is brought up by the note of beeswax instead of honey, which has a different accord to honey. It's this animalic beeswax with this with these aromatic notes um, supporting everything, okay? So the aromatic notes are the supporting notes. Sage, rosemary, tarragon, cedar. It's so good. If I could get a full bottle of any long-lost private blend, this would be it. I love Moss Brex. Um, and it's just too bad that it's long gone. Tom Ford created some amazing fragrances. Oh, there's a 50 ml bottle, by the way. I should mention this. There's a 50 ml bottle of this on eBay for $1,500, okay? Um, so, either the guy's smoking crack or that's where we're going with this, but uh, Moss Brex, amazing fragrance. And then my favorite honey, patchouli, animalic fragrance, maybe of all time, not more than Kuros, but if you just, Kuros doesn't have the patchouli, this does. This is Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. This is a splash, obviously. This is a spray. Anytime I have a backup bottle, you know I love it. This is totally backup bottle worthy. This is three backup bottles worthy, but I don't need it. Oh, my God. This is, to me, I just... I just feel so at home wearing these. I don't know what else to say. I'm lost for words. I mean, the patchouli, the civet, the leather, the orris, the the honey, the cinnamon, they all just create this masculine, just, this is so masculine. I don't care if I smell like my father or my grandfather wearing this. I don't care. You know, this is how a man should smell, not like bubble gum and caramel and, you know, hazelnut. Okay. Next, we're going to go to the 1980s again. Um, and again, these are all linked from Pavarotti, Mossbrex, Givenchy, this one, and, and then the final one. They all have some linkage. You know, the final one is kind of on its own, but this one is kind of the last in that patchouli line, if you will. This is uh, Giorgio for Men by Giorgio Beverly Hills. 1984, this came out. Um, this is, again, patchouli, honey, oak moss, benzoin, cinnamon, carnation, rose. Oh, it's so good. It, you know, this is a vintage bottle, okay? But I hear that the, the current bottle formulation is very good. But look at the color of the juice. The new juice does not look like this. Um, when you want honey patchouli, you could reach for... Any of these, okay, honey patchouli, any of these right here, and you are home. I mean, you can't do better honey patchoulis than what I just showed you right there. They are literally the, the best honey patchoulis. The only one that I think has some honey, but it's not listed, so I didn't include it. The brother of this and the father of Givenchy, gentlemen, is Pierre Cardin, Poor Monsieur from 1972. That's the other patchouli that is not listing a honey note. I get a honey accord from that, but I didn't list it. Uh, but if you like Giorgio by Giorgio Beverly Hills, try to find a vintage bottle of Pierre Cardin's Poor Monsieur. And then, you know, this is going to be the picture at the beginning. This is going to be the thumbnail picture because this encompasses honey fragrances to me. And again, one of my favorites... Totally backup bottle worthy. Uh, this came out in 1985, year of my birth. Great year. Pierre Wargnai was the perfumer. And this is Boss Number One. Now, look at my old bottle of Boss Number One. It actually says Number One right there. And look at the back before, before barcodes when they used to put stickers on things. Someone wrote that by hand. Was 48, now 33. Um, my God. Uh, this is an older bottle. Look, it doesn't say number one right here. Anuj, thank you for finding this for me, my friend. Honestly, this was a... I was so happy when you found this bottle for me. Um, they're both made in the UK. 
Both of these are made in the UK. Um, but this one's older because it doesn't say boss number one right there. This is the epitome of pissy, animalic, masculine honey. There's tobacco in here. Um, it's aromatic because it has sage, artemisia, juniper. There's citruses, but it's all about the oak moss, honey, tobacco, cinnamon, cedar. This is the epitome, guys. Seriously. Uh, the stuff Boss is putting out now is crap. The scent, crap. The scent accord intense crap. The scent accord intense intense maximum, uh, you know, crap. All that stuff doesn't matter what they do. Lay parfum, uh, lay parfum intense crap. This is what you want to wear if you're going to wear a Boss fragrance. This and Boss Sport for the summer. Boss Sport is one of my favorite sport fragrances from the '80s. Um, that's it. I mean, this this just dominates the current stuff Boss is putting out. Even Boss Bottle, this just dominates. I mean, you know, this is this is just what I want to wear. This is what I feel at home with. This is what I love. And and these animalic, this is the epitome of pissy animalic honey for men done right, in my opinion. So, I hope you've enjoyed. It obviously takes me a long time to pull all this out. But this was a very necessary episode for a This Is Not A Top 10. I think this is a new record on time, an hour and 16 minutes. So, I really appreciate everyone watching. If there are some honey fragrances that I do not have, I would love to hear your thoughts down below. And if you own some of these, love some of these, want some of these, please let me know. Cheers, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.